can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yeah. And no, it's true that I've been working with Spencer in many contexts in um, in Germany and in uh, in the Venice Biennale and in many small or big exhibitions. So I'm very happy to to try to give some sort of introduction, but more importantly, perhaps, to make us all get a chance to listen to the artist. Um, where can we begin? Uh, maybe I should just say a few words, because you're not uh, going to introduce yourself like that. I mean, Spencer is, as I think most of you know, a New York-based artist who is uh, educated in, on the East Coast at the Rhode Island School of Design. And uh, there, if I remember correctly, you didn't study art primarily. You studied at light art, or you studied ceramics, no? Yeah. Um, and I've always thought that that is some sort of a key or, you know, to, to your work, not because you're doing ceramics anymore, uh, but because there's some sort of craft element in almost everything we do. I mean, it's, uh, when Klaus said it's always, it's not just, you know, products for the, for, to decorate or, you know, it's uh, always a very intellectual, um, there's always a very intellectual level in almost everything, in, basically in every work. So one could think that it's a kind of conceptual art practice, and, and I'm sure it is. Mm -hmm. But there's also some sort of uh, uh, insistence on things that are handmade at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, is this? Do you think I'm wrong, or is this, does it have to do with your background in ceramics? Um, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where it comes from, but I like making things. And, uh, uh, I mean, I like, uh, and like, for example, this drawing, which is made just by rubbing pastel with my hands into the paper, is um, something that I worked on in New York and then wanted to sort of see what it looked like here, and so continued working on it here during the, uh, during the installation of the exhibition. And um, to just sort of uh, work with the powder and, and, and rub it in and, and to, um, have something uh, come from nothing is uh, is I think the great pleasure of being of being an artist. And, uh, but I know I mean I'll just interrupt you so that you <laughs> I know that Rhode Island School of Design is many things, uh -huh. but among teachers who were there were were uh, actually the founder of conceptual art, and, 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 and basically Joseph Kosuk was there occasionally. And, yeah. and and I wonder if your art is not a total misunderstanding of conceptual. <laughs> I mean, why would you start doing, making things with your hand? Conceptual art is not about that. Well, no, but I also, I mean, the fact is I also got kicked out of the ceramics department. So I, 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 I was totally, I was totally I was actually kicked out of the school because I, because I was making videos and performance and things. So I, I, I realized, I, I, I think the, the realization about making that I had because I, I mean, now I realize how, I mean, I was so stupid, but th this idea that the material that you work with could have, uh, could actually have meaning. Whereas when I was making ceramics, I thought everything in the universe could be said through the medium of ceramics. And so it had never occurred to me that the material actually has some sort of message or that the, uh, the, the form itself and the material can have, have content. So, so then I thought, oh, well, you know, not everything can be expressed in clay. And that's when I experimented in other things and, um, and got into trouble. But I think something that is, uh, that does connect back to the early days uh, in ceramics is this idea of testing, where you would always, for example, when you're making glazes, you would test lots of different glazes and try, there's a lot of trial and error <coughs> in this idea, this sort of scientific method of testing, of testing things and trying and trying and uh, with that sort of hands-on way is something I think comes from that experience. I mean, things are never only what they um, look like. There's always some sort of hidden message, or there's something in each piece. And I mean, for the first time, maybe you've done it before, but I've never seen it before, that you do arrangements with flowers uh -huh. or with plants. And they, we can all see that they have some sort of, that there's some sort of color pattern or color some sort of logic in them, they're, they, they're different, they're not just random, but I know that they relate to quotes from a little book by Ludwig Wittgenstein, 
and, and maybe you can just say you what you are. You can just tell that from looking at it. Right? I see it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I cheated. I read the press release. <laughs> no, but I mean, and Wittgenstein, who some of you know as one of the influential philosophers of the 20th century, he wrote a very strange book, the last thing he wrote, were marginal notes uh, reading Goethe's color uh, doctrine, Pfadenlehre, and people have misunderstood that book, thinking that he had some sort of color doctrine on his head. He was more kind of interested in how do we see colors and how do color actually signify and what is a color. And uh, these are, this is a book that is not so easy to understand, but you have somehow, what can one say, not illustrated, but almost. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it is. I mean, I think that was sort of the problem that I had with conceptual art also, and with, uh, with someone like Kossuth, who, de who deals with philosophy, and who, when I was a student, I thought he was so fantastic, and then, as often is the case, then you turn on someone like that, and it always feel, I always felt the problem was that it was, there was no inflection, that it was basically a sort of illustration of philosophical ideas, which I'm not so, so interested in, and so, so this, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I, I go back to that, that book a lot. It's something I, I find incredibly interesting because it is, it is in a way, a color theory without a sort of overall um, uh, system. I, I mean, it's, it's very, um, it's anecdotal, it's uh, incidental, it's, uh, it's a lot of epigrams. So it's not, it's, it's not a complete system of color uh, theory that like Goethe or, or Newton made. And so I think for me it's about uh, looking, um, looking at the world and also like thinking of doing something. I mean, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do. Um, I mean, I, I knew sort of what I wanted to do, but uh, I, some of them I'm particularly fond of. For example, the third one from this side is uh, Wittgenstein talks a lot about the sort of philosophical implications of color blindness and its relationship to also to language and seeing and, and understanding uh, color and uh, the sort of uh, what it means to, to not see certain color. So this is taking a, uh, a test for color blindness, the Ishikawa test for color blindness, red, green, color blind, which is um, about 10% of males have uh, red, green, color blindness. Blue, yellow, color blindness is, is much less um, uh, common. And th so those colors, the, the, the oranges and the greens are the colors from the Ishikawa test that, uh, that sort of create, um, that, that you would, so if, is there anyone here who's colorblind? Sir? No, but my brother. Uh -huh. So when I know, he cannot see the difference between them and neither between red and uh, red. Really? Uh -huh. uh -huh. Yeah, so it's, so it's, um, so for me, I mean, it's sort of a, I mean, of course it could be done in a much more sort of clinical way, but to, uh, this idea of doing it with plants and with, and it, uh, the soil in a sort of weird, for some weird reason, that I'm not totally sure, of, was uh, sent from Vienna. So it's Viennese soil, which is where uh, uh, Wittgenstein was from. And there's a, there's a beautiful quote in another book of his where he talks about his ideas as being not a seed, the originality of his ideas not being a seed, but a soil. So that uh, these ideas, which he takes from other people, I mean Goethe or Lichtenberg or whoever, his ideas about color, would grow differently in his soil uh, than they would in another soil. So, um, so it's, I, I don't know, some sort of like uh, 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 peculiar homage to thinking about color without creating a system to explain it all. It's really more like asking questions about color, which I find much more interesting. Are these uh, for sale? Uh, <laughs> so, but, I mean, so if you if you if you collect it, if you actually acquire it, I mean, if someone here wants it, or if we want to have it in the museum or whatever, what do we actually buy? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I was thinking, I mean, because this is an experimental thing, and I was thinking, oh, it would be so great to create a huge garden. I mean, more out of more than seven remarks, you know, I mean, there are probably more than thirty remarks that could be used to create these sort of uh, these arrangements. So it'd be. I mean, it'd be fun to create, I mean, and silly, I think kind of silly, to create a garden totally based on, on Wittgenstein's thoughts of, of color. So, but I, then you would have to take care of it for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so there, there, there are lots of references in your work to 
to poetry or to philosophical remarks by interesting people like Wittgenstein. Um, the, the show has the title also. Yes. And maybe you should. I don't, I'm yeah, actually, I, not everyone read the like, press release. Yeah, my, it, yeah, I even have a, I mean, it's, it's sort of a bad sign when you can't remember the title. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something like. <laughs> something like. <laughs> <laughs> Something about the eye. The, the, eye, eye, both the, the, yeah. eye, the eye that you see is not an eye because you see it, it's an eye because it sees you. And it's from the, uh, it's a quote that I found in a book by the uh, amazing sort of classicist and poet uh, Anne Carson, and she's quoting the Spanish poet Antonio uh, Machado. Um, so I love this idea of, of seeing as being a sort of two-way street, and this idea of these, like, I, I mean, these sort of, uh, not necessarily perceiving, but like shooting their color information into our eyes somehow. So, but also this idea of, uh, of course, of the subjectivity of vision, which is what's uh, I think present in all the work. So, <laughs> protest from the audience. <laughs> and so I visited Spencer in his studio upstate New York, or on the border between New York and Connecticut, and then. Uh, on my way home, I realized that uh, Jasper Jones is in the same village. And then 10 minutes further is Ellsworth Kelly, although the, he passed away. And then I started to develop a theory about who you are, uh, uh, or rather who you want to be, or who you uh, are becoming, and that you're placing yourself very strategically. I mean, uh, Jasper Jones is, uh, you know, uh, uh, someone who did, you remember the early Jasper Jones thing with, with figures or numbers and colors, and it's a kind of semiotics of, of vision and language. There's never pure vision, it's always language. Mm. And then there's uh, the greatest, I think, American artist for me, Elizabeth Kelly, mm. uh, just like unbelievably visually, visually beautiful things. And I think that's where you try to be. Mm. Am I correct? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but then I also know that now you're a, a, a little bit in the south of France. So there are always, always bigger fish. So, you know, behind Elsworth Kelly is, of course, Matisse. Uh -huh. so, so somewhere in that world, you're. No, but joke aside, it, 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 I think it's it, to do with the, um, these references are maybe random, but, but they are artists who are interested in visually beautiful things and, and you know, in visual impact, but also with some sort of a linguistic or poetic kind of infrastructure. It's always, it's never just what you see, it's also, especially in Jasper Jones, one can see that it's, you know, some sort of uh, philosophical investigation about what you can see. Yeah, I think it's also a fear of color on some level, a fear of, yeah. Here, up here, I mean, sometimes, some of the pieces, when we will talk about this wall in a, in a second, sometimes you get the sense that it's verging on abstraction or even, you know, on monochromatic things. Mm -hmm. But it's never really just, I mean, I know some of your works, uh, for instance, there's a kind of gray mono, monochromatic piece, but it's actually depicting fog. Mm -hmm. So then why? It's, you, you never let just things be a abstract or, or um, monochromatic. There's always some sort of excuse that there, you know, it's <laughs> actually not abstract because it's what you see if you're on the, on the Empire State Building and it's total zero visibility. Yeah. And then, so you're always playing with, with abstraction or you know, pure visibility, but it's actually always some sort of, when you understand the piece, there's something else to it. Yeah, I mean, I'm interested in that idea of making a connection to the world, and so it's not, it's not just, I mean, that there is a sort of, uh, some sort of back and forth between this action of seeing, this sort of phenomenology of seeing, or whatever, and the, and what it is that you, what it is that you see, and, um, you know, whether it's the eye or, or something else, and so I think, uh, I mean, I, I love abstraction, and I love looking at abstraction, but I'm not interested in making abstraction, because I, I feel that it's, um, I feel that I don't have anything to add to that particular um, Because it's uh, exhausted or because you cannot come up with anything, any new version of what abstract could mean? 
I, 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 maybe both of those. I mean, it would certainly be exhausted for me because if I had to, if I just had a blank canvas and I just had to make something out of nothing, it, it, it would be very hard. So there's always some sort of external stimulus that starts it and, and that there is, and also that often determines the colors. And that's, I think, what I meant when I... Because I feel also there's a, some other kind of, not trap, but you're... It's always about something. So there's some sort of aboutness in every piece. That yeah. you can, it's never that it's just there and beautiful or yeah. interesting. It's about something. Yeah. Isn't that a kind of another kind of limitation? <laughs> that it has to be about. I mean, cannot just be itself. Yeah. Well, I, I, um, if it's just itself, it, it, I, I think it's not sort of uh, in interesting mm -hmm. enough. I mean, there's a, there's a piece hiding behind this wall where you should go and look afterwards. It's part of the show. And there are two light pieces that on the surface it might look like Dan Flavin or something, or, or I don't know. There are many artists who've used the tube, light tubes. And, but, and you've been working with that since decades or many, many years. Yeah. But they're also not just what, they're, uh, what they look like. They are the light that they offer reconstructs a specific place. Maybe you should, I mean, you can tell us, because I can't remember exactly. Yeah, so it's the light of the Bauhaus. It's the, the light on the far side. It's the light of Kandinsky studio, which was right next to a Clay studio. And the light on the right side is the light from Clay's studio. And the, the combination of the colors of the filters, which is used to recreate that light by filtering it, filtering the, the light itself, is um, is uh, they're specific to paintings by Kandinsky and Clay. So it is, it's a, it's, it's really a sort of, um, well, it's, in a way it's a picture of the Bauhaus, but uh, it's, it's uh, a sort of recreation of the, the actual light of that place. So it's a, a, a sort of very specific uh, experience of, of the Bauhaus recreated very accurately. And uh, Spencer's done many pieces that have that are about light, or rather that are light, but the light carries a specific significance or meaning because it, it's, it recreates the light at a specific place at a specific moment. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's like the light outside being transformed so that you're catapulted into another place. And I remember in Texas, you did Paris, Texas. Yeah, yeah. So in Texas, in what's the city? Uh, San Antonio. San Antonio, you had Parisian light. Yeah. But so how does that actually work? I mean, how do you... In that case, it was a stained glass window, and so the uh, glass was very blue, and, it, and, the, and the summer light of, uh, of Texas is very yellow, and so I used the colorimeter to shift the color. It was only accurate for about four hours a day in the afternoon, because it's, the light, of course, is always changing out there, but it takes that yellow light, shifts it to the blue light uh, of, of uh, winter in, um, in Paris, France. And so it's a sort of interesting dialectic between these two places and uh, sort of seeing being in two places at, at once and the title of course comes from the, the inventors film paris texas so i mean spencer makes tiny or small scale work very kind of poetic and handcrafted and lyrical and you know all of that but at the same time you're doing massive installations in the public sphere and and that's something i just wanted to ask you about because it seems so um I mean, I can understand that they're, that they're made by the same artist, but you do these works on paper that are very kind of humble. And at the same time, right now, you're doing a huge thing in London, I know, which is coming up now. Yeah. And it's where Paddington Station. So, yeah, it's a canopy, a huge glass canopy for the new Paddington Station. And for those of you, I see some colleagues and friends from Stockholm, when you, end, when you come out of the railway station, the central station, you see a kind of light thing go, on Vasagatan, which is not massively large, but I mean, bigger than all of these things. But when did you start doing public work in the public sphere? Um, and, and why would you, I mean, who came up with the idea to invite someone like you who do these things to do massive things in the, uh, as the part first, of market? Actually, the first public thing I did was about, I guess, about 15 years ago, and I was offered to do this thing by the government to, in the, for a, um, that turned out to be a disaster, and so I, um, uh, it was horrible. So it was a, a piece that was on the, um, at a border station between the US and Canada, which in 
at this time has you know, much more meaning than it did then. Then it was basically just a place to drive by. Um, but it, uh, it was wind vanes. I decided to make these wind vanes that were, uh, that were uh, very subtly different shades of white because it snows a lot up there and I was interested in that. And um, I didn't know what I was doing. I had a fabricator who was not very good and, and not very responsible. I had an uh, engineer who uh, I don't think went to engineering school. <laughs> and, uh, I, um, and as soon as it was installed, like two days after it was installed, it was beautiful for two days. And then I was back uh, in New York and I got a call that there had been uh, very high winds the night before and the whole thing had blown apart. And um, totally all, there were 37 of these veins and every single one had like blown to smithereens. So it was a very bad experience. And so I guess I, I learned the, the hard way. And then I've since done, you know, other things. And it's, um, it's nice to do work that is, is um, you know, out in the public and people see it and people experience it. I think it's a really hard thing to do. And I was always, um, skeptical of public art and I was critical of other artists who did public art and so uh, you know now I'm like the, the sh shoe is on the other foot or what, what, would the, uh, what would the Paddington piece look like? The Paddington piece is so it's a huge glass canopy 120 meters long by uh, 25 meters wide uh, that is I think uh, 180 panels of glass and it is um, it is drawings. It's pastel drawings of clouds. So it's um, they, it, it, uh, so it's 37 different types of clouds. So it's a sort of cloud spotting index for um, you know for English people who really like uh, <laughs> who like to categorize things and like to look at clouds. So uh, and it it is something. I mean, there had to be something in this glass anyway that that limited the light because otherwise it would just when the sun those rare days when the sun is out in London it would bake everything. And so, so it is a, um, it's a sort of homage in some ways to uh, cloud painters like Constable especially, um, and to this obsession with clouds and naming clouds and also the first uh, nomenclature from clouds was, um, was uh, created by uh, Luke Howard, an English uh, meteorologist. And, um, and then also the clouds will project onto the floor and the wall of the station when the sun when the sun is shining. And when is this up? It's just started installation and it will be installed over the summer and then the station will finally be open in um, I think next January. So, so but if we we, we yes. will see when we come to London. Yes, if you take you come with the uh, yeah if you take Heathrow Express yeah. from yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, and, so that is and that's my fear actually with these big projects is that they, you know, if you do a exhibition like this and it's a disaster, you know, you kind of can put everything away and then in two or three years Klaus forgets that it was a disaster and he, he only remembers the good times. But if you do a big architectural installation like that, it will be obvious it's there to fail. and, you, and you, there's nothing you can do. And I like joked with the architects, I said, well, maybe we can change it now. And they said, no, there's no changing. And so, <laughs> but this so is nothing this permanent. Will yes, it be there a hundred years, minimum. Yes. <laughs> minimum. So, yeah. Okay. so I have this fear that it's not going to work so well and I'll have to fly into Gatwick. <laughs> but <laughs> compared to another project, I feel this is not so risky because you did another thing which I felt could have gone totally wrong. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it did. And maybe some of you have seen it or you've seen pictures of it. Um, it's a huge rectangular art piece at the Ground Zero Museum. What is it called? Ground yeah, Zero? Yeah, the 9 11 Museum. Mm -hmm. And uh, so difficult to, to do something like a monument there. And many of us have seen pictures, you have probably all seen pictures without knowing it, with the Obamas and the mayor of New York and people passing by, normally not looking at Spencer's piece, just <laughs> passing by. But, but then there's a famous piece which my mother is so obsessed with. She looks at it very often. And it's a, 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 with a pope looking at your piece. Yeah, he's praying in front of it. Yeah, he's actually praying. And it's a, please get rid of this artwork. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, I mean, when you were invited there, I'm sure, you must have thought this can only go wrong. Yeah. But but you did it, and and uh, and, and is it there? Is is that permanent or is it? Yeah, it was originally just going to be there for one year, and now it, the decision has been to make it permanent. So. 
So it's a, it's a large rectangle showing the color of the sky, but not one color. It's actually individual pieces. Maybe you can tell us what it is. Yeah, so it's 2,987, I think, squares, uh, individual watercolors, each a different shade of blue, about this big, of trying to remember the color of the sky on, that, on the morning of 9-11. Of so that there's a number of people who died during the, the attack. And, um, and so it's a sort of like a mosaic, and each one is hand-painted, so you just get a sense of, of the hand. And it's, um, it's, a very, it's a huge concrete wall that the architects really liked. And so they were very much against this um, artwork going in, and, and uh, but I think they maybe have come around. And uh, but who invited you? How does that work? <coughs> they were desperate for something there because it was just so depressing. And so the uh, so the committee that was organizing the museum was uh, asked a few artists to do proposals, and mine was selected. So it was a competition. Yeah. yeah I mean, they've been trying. They they had so many things that went wrong. So this was like their last attempt. So in a way, I mean, it looks like a big monochrome, and it is, but it's also 2,987 <laughs> memories, so to say, of, I mean, individual, it's one little piece for every person. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it is my, but it's me trying to remember, and so it's really about this activity of remembering, and so I, I basically, in order to do that, and I wanted each one to be different, but they all had to be uh, genuine, that is, they had to be something that actually came from my memory of that sky that day. And so I kind of created a color space of, um, of blue and created a margin, and all of the colors that I mixed had to come within that border. And so I knew, I knew that it sort of, so first I sort of said, well, this is absolutely as, as green a blue as I can remember it being. This is as gray a blue, this is as light a blue. So I worked within that color space to create all those colors. So it was, it was about my, you know, my memory, and, and you know, especially about this sort of fallibility of, of memory, which I think is so, the subjectivity of memory, which for me is so beautiful and human, and um, I think also a part of the mourning that the, the people who, um, who lost friends and family in the, at, the, at the World Trade Center so. And again, each and every one is handmade. Yeah. Hand painted by you. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's uh, actually something interesting that uh, Spencer makes these big projects and has uh, exhibitions in many parts of the world. And I think about studio visits because that's what I that's part of my job to do: visit artists and talk to them in, in their studios. And I, I remember one or two of your assistants, but it's a pretty you're pretty lonesome actually. You're doing most of it on your own, and I can compare it to someone whose work is on some level sometimes a little bit similar, mm -hmm. Ulafer here in Berlin, who has now I think 90 assistants or something, mm -hmm. you know, he of course also produces architecture and you know, it's even a bigger operation, mm -hmm. but you, you're, your studio is very old school in that sense, that you have a little bit of support, but not much. Yeah, yeah well I like making things, and in that case I felt it was originally designed as a light projection, of changing light, you know, of 3,000 shades of light that the projection would change, and I really felt that it wasn't the right form for that, for that context, and I felt that what I needed to do uh, needed to be more of a devotional activity almost, to sort of, you know, more for New York City, which is my home, and to do something that, that had some devotional element of sort of doing it. So I spent almost three months just doing those, just doing those drawings. So what is this? This is really a collection, it's called Pollen, from, from a novellist title of, of, of a collection. And it's a sort of fragments of kind of small ideas and observations of different things that I have been working on and thinking about for 20 years. The oldest little drawing, which is the, the blue one the, uh, uh, on the, the upper left, that, which is a drawing I did. I was very interested in seeing what Icarus saw when he fell into the sea, so I made elaborate plan. well, I did research finding out where it was that he fell and then went to the closest island to, the, to where he fell and did drawings of the sky and the sea so I could see what he saw when he, when, when he fell. Um, and then the most recent one, weirdly, is the one that looks the most like that, which is the red and green one, which is a, a, um, a, which is a drawing of the smell of spring just from two weeks ago. 
when I had the first whiff of spring in, um, in New York. And so it's a sort of synesthesia uh, experience. And so the beginning of the smell is at the bottom, the end of the smell is at the top. So if you know that sort of, sort of rich, uh, fantastic smell of spring finally coming and everything melting, that, that was my attempt to, to create that smell. So it's, it's different things that are connected to ideas about logic and mathematics and time and, um, and observation and the squares, uh, for example, is squared squares. So it's, a, uh, it's the smallest number of squared squares of different sizes that can fit within a square, which is 21. <coughs> and, um, and in that case, there is a color system, uh, which is the color, all of the, uh, my Windsor and Newton watercolors, I put in alphabetical order and then a numeric order, so square number one is the smallest one, and that's alizarin crimson, and square number 97, which is the biggest one, is, uh, is yellow ochre. So that, that's an example of a color system that I really like, because the system makes the decisions. So all of these, it's a very different work, it's not something, I've, I've never made anything like this, but I had this idea of having these small little, little fragments, um, which I've been reading a lot of um, in the last few months. Uh, so, I mean, you know, I guess it's a really sort of obvious and undigested response to things that I've read recently and have, have really admired. So, um, so mean, again, they are, I mean, they're all observations about perception, perception's relationship to other capacities such as memory or, or uh, linguistic kind of Yeah, well this is actually a really like new one too. I've done, I, I've done this before, which is a star. So this is the star uh, Kaf, which is in Cassiopeia. And so you can see that little dot there. It's, it looks white, but it's a slightly yellow star. And so that star is um, 54 light years away, which is the same age as me. So the light that I observed looking at that star is the same age as I am. So I, I like to make, I mean, it's my some, some sort of weird connection to the universe somehow, which I, I like to do. And I've, I've had various stars over the years because, you know, I mean, the star is always the same. You know, if you're like 25, you have a light uh, star that's 25 light years away. You, you, after your birthday, it's no longer your star. Um, <laughs> So, um, so you have to find you have to find new stars to, uh, <laughs> to have. Since we're going through the whole show, and this is a kind of little tour, basically, now we can't see it because there are too many people. But on at the on the back wall, there's a there are other kind of observations, and and I, if I understood correctly, they're all from your studio, right? Yeah, yeah. So these are all photographs. The third one from the, no, the second one from the right was the last was the first one that I did, and it was. These sort of amazing uh, forms that, that these light projections that happen on the walls of the studio at different times of day. And uh, I mean, um, I love just being alone there. And um, one nice thing about not having assistants around is that you, no one's watching you and no one's judging you, which is, of course, what they're doing all the time. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're basically kind of annoyed about your assistants. <laughs> So, you can, so I, mean, I love just sort of sitting and, 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 and watching. So after I saw that one incredible uh, moment, I started watching it at different times of day. So it's, it's a sort of sequence. It's not all one day. It's a, it's a sort of composite within two weeks. So the first one is this first thing in the morning at like 6.45 in the morning when the sun is bursting in from the east, and that's on the west wall. And the um, last one is the sun coming from the west, of course onto the east wall. So it's, it's also a sort of, it's a, kind of a circumnavigation around the room in the opposite direction in which the sun is moving through the, uh, through the world. So, um, but it, it's, um, you know, kind of within the, within the tradition of the, like a picture of the artist's studio. And also what I like is the sun, when the sun is out, hits this wall a bit. And so it becomes activated by the real sort of solar event in this space. And that relationship between the light in this space and the work in this space is something that's really uh, interesting to me with that work and also this fog work and then of course the light which is uh, really a big part of uh, the plant work as well. And I don't think we're gonna go on forever, but this is a chance to also, if someone has a question or a comment, um, is there anyone who wants to ask Ask Spencer anything about the show? 
I have a question because I'm working in the building in Stockholm, uh -huh. where you have made the uh, installation. Uh -huh. yeah. So I'm a little bit curious what is behind it. Yeah. Um, but everyone has not seen it, but it's a, a light work. Yeah. yeah. And so it's, it's also flashing a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So that is a piece that's based on the light of Times Square. So I was uh, interested in so that the idea is sort of a it's kind of silly, but taking the light of Times Square and bringing it to the center of another city. So each of those each of those panels, when it lights up, it, so I used a color light meter, which I use the same that I used in the Bauhaus to measure the light in uh, in Times Square, which is always changing. So I think there. 15 different panels in that work, and, uh, and, those, and each one is a different moment of the light in Times Square. So, and it is, it is a sort of homage also to the um, great New York paintings of Pierre Mondrian, the uh, Broadway boogie woogie. So it's, it's, it's uh, and so the colors sort of reference Mondrian a bit, and to trying to sort of take this energy of New York and, um, and, uh, Transport it somewhere else. So, so when you're standing there in front of that that work, you're having the same experience as uh, same sort of light experience as you would have with the changing light in, in Times Square. So it's this idea of sort of energetic. But I mean, it's the first time I ever took a, 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 a artificial light and recreated. It. I'm usually more interested in using uh, using natural light of a place like the Bauhaus, someplace and changing it and bringing it somewhere. So it's, it's a sort of it's sort of taking something to another place. Well, the meaning of this little conversation is simply to, for you all to get a sense on about of how Spencer thinks about the work and, and the, you know what's behind them, and, and we can see recurring themes, you know, certain understandings of light or of perception and how language enters the whole thing. And we haven't gone into the solar obsession of yours which I've written about at some point. There was a show called uh, What Time Is It On The Sun? And, and, and uh, it seems that the sun is very present almost everywhere. And if you stare into the sun, you'll, be, you'll get blind. And that is kind of the, the polarities in your world, blindness and, and vision, and the total visibility and kind of where everything goes dark, I feel. But that's for another conversation, and uh, we will I think simply stop here and say thank you to Spencer, and you can all ask questions, but without an audience. Thank that, you is, so that is also, I'd just like to say that title, What Time Is It On The Sun, is a title that I got from Daniel, who has... Uh, That's why I mentioned Who's had uh, various influences on me uh, over the years, and it's been, I mean, I think one of the great uh, pleasures of being an artist and being in the art world is that you make uh, wonderful friends who you then sort of continue to travel uh, through this through time with it. It's, uh, it's a real, that's a real pleasure for me as well. Thanks. That's very nice. <laughs> and now you can ask us whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs>